We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, roll call first, please. Gary, Grinberg. Here. Pepcorn. Here. Strand. Mahoney. Here. Gary is working and Strand is out of town, just so you know it's the reason they're not here today. This is a special city commission me meeting to hear the appeal of Aaron Cockfield, formal equipment operator at Solid Waste Department. On September 19, 2017, the Civil Service Commission heard Mr. Cockfield's appeal and found that his termination was for cause and was not motivated by political or other improper considerations. The Civil Service Commission upheld Aaron Cockfield's termination of employment. While the power of disciplinary action or the discharge rests with the appointing authority, the role of the Civil Service Commission in, in a hearing process is to ensure that such dis disciplinary actions are not motivated by political or improper considerations. Upon appeal to the City Commission, the City Commission is charged with hearing the appeal testimony, asking any additional questions we might have, and making a determination as to whether the findings and conclusion of the Civil Service Commission stand. As indicated in an email, email dated October 20th from the HR Director, Joe Manette, the City Commission has set a two-hour time limit to this hearing. In addition, to the City Commission will not be accepting any no, new materials or witnesses at this time. I think Commissioner Pepcorn was referring to uh, what we get at this time as far as the summary and in, uh, in an outline, which we, I think we have present here, unless you guys want to do anything different. No, you'd like to follow that. So the procedure today is, will be this way, as both parties appointed authority and agreed party may exercise the right to have a representation participate in the hearing, which we have. The commission would like to have all parties speak personally on to the issues as well. Parties and or the representatives will not be able to directly question witnesses for the opposing party. The <laughs> format for the, today's hearing is as follows. The opening statement by the employee or representative opening statement by the appointed authority representative, employee witnesses, if any, appointed authority witnesses, if any, commission questions the employee or employee witnesses, the commission questions appointing authority or appointing witnesses, final statement by the employee, and final statement by the appointing authority. This is going to be recorded, and please speak into the mic as we go. So I think we'd proceed at this time, unless the commissioners want to do anything different. Opening statement by the employee and representative at this time. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mayor Mahoney. Uh, my name is Leo Wilking. I'm an attorney here in Fargo. I represent Aaron Cockfield. Uh, Mayor Mahoney, as you know, you and I have engaged in some uh, correspondence regarding the scope of this hearing and uh, additional exhibits. It's my position that there was new evidence at the Civil Service Commission hearing which Mr. Cockfield was not allowed to address. I've asked that this commission accept two photographs and one affidavit, which are extremely germane and relevant. And they were attached to my letter to you of October 26, uh, exhibits F, G, H, I, J. I take it from your statement this morning in your correspondence that the commission will not allow any of those exhibits into the record. Mr. Wilkie, you already shared those with all my commissioners in an email, and I'm presumption is in a sense that you've already placed them in, in, in witness as evidence because when commissioners probably opened them. Nancy, you want to respond to that, please? <clears throat> well, I would not believe they were admitted into evidence. At this time, you can uh, agree to receive them if you wish, um, but it's, it's one of those, it's, it's already in, you've seen it. I don't have any objection to it. Um, I did not... Uh, bring forward additional evidence based on the correspondence that I did receive from uh, the commission that no new evidence would be submitted. So I would just like you to take that into consideration as well. Commissioner, what would you like to do? Well, I, um, this is a new experience to understand the process. I and mean, if, if, if both parties knew that there was a deadline for submission of material, then it's emailed after, I guess, you know, is that is that protocol, is that acceptable in itself by definition, or is it something we just acknowledge and because it was emailed? I don't know if it was it, between parties if that's something that it was well understood. So I don't want to you know, mix you know, details, but to me, we already received it. It is what it is, but you know, what, are, what are the parties agreed to? Was an email prior to this meeting acceptable? Well, Commissioner Grinberg, unfortunately, as I pointed out in one of my letters to the mayor, there are no 
rules or procedures spelled out in Sydney ordinance or regulation regarding how this hearing is conducted, what evidence you can receive, any deadlines, and so forth. And so I simply indicated that there was material offered to the Civil Service Commission that was new, that I was not able to address, which I think is very unfair to my client. And I've not, I'm not asking to go beyond my 50-minute deadline. I'm asking for two photographs and one affidavit to be admitted, not even the testimony of Mr. Hauge, but they're extremely relevant, extremely germane. So I just wanted that on the record, Mayor Mahoney. Is so what happens is, is that we're actually, as a commission, making a decision whether the Civil Service Commission made the proper judgment, and, and, and it's really what they had before them. So in my interpretation, it's a little unfair for us to see other data because the commission made their decision on what was shown before them, and it'd be like bringing other data in front to say, hey, hey, we missed this or did this. We're actually just making the judgment that they had a fair hearing and we agree with their findings at that time. It's a little unfair to them to suddenly say, by the way, we had new evidence of other things through this commission because they didn't have that in front of them. That's why I didn't want to accept it. So I agree with you, Mayor. I think we just have to go by what, what was then. And can I ask you, why wasn't that done ahead of time? Was it? Commissioner Pepcorn, it wasn't done ahead of time because I didn't know that Sean Eckery was going to testify that he had a habit of calling everyone boy in the department. That was the first time the city raised that issue, was at the hearing. I heard it for the first time. Aaron Cockfield heard it for the first time. I couldn't call Mr. Aaron Cockfield to the stand again to rebut it. I couldn't call any witnesses to rebut it. So that's why it's coming up now for the first time, because I never had a chance to address it. And it goes directly to the heart of the racial issues in this department. And when someone makes a statement, now I've got you, boy, I've got you now, boy, that suggests to me that race, which is, would certainly be an improper factor in the termination of my client, should be an issue that's investigated and explored by this commission, and which was not adequately considered by the Civil Service Commission because I had no opportunity to address it. And you have an affidavit of a 30-year Civil Service Solid Waste Department employee who says that Mr. Eckery never once used the term boy, that this is a complete fabrication. And the photographs, what, what's the harm in accepting photographs of the break room, which, which, Ms., um, which the chair of the Civil Service Commission herself said at the hearing, photographs would have been better. Why do I have a diagram from Mr. Ludlam when photographs would be better? That's, that's all I've asked that you consider. <clears throat> Nancy, did you want anything else to say? I would just submit that there is no requirement that this commission consider additional evidence. The evidence was presented to the Civil Service Commission. They had an opportunity to consider all of the evidence and made a determination that Mr. Cockfield was terminated with cause based on the workplace violence. And I would ask that you, um, although I understand that there are no specific rules which would prevent you from considering that additional evidence that your review be limited to the what the civil service considered and make a determination based on that evidence well in a sense we've already received it mr wilkie so what i'd rather do is let's go ahead with the normal protocol here we have an opening statement by the employee and yourself uh, the commissioners have received via email what you sent out it's their choice whether they do anything else with it Thank you. And I guess I'd like to go to the regular hearing in your opening statements. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a brief uh, statement on behalf of Mr. Cockfield, and then we'll, of course, be asking him questions uh, a little bit later. Um, Mr. Cockfield joined the Solid Waste Department in March of 2009. Um, he had been in Fargo four years. He's originally from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, but came to Fargo from New York in 2005. He has an unblemished record at the Solid Waste Department until uh, July 28, 2017. He had one verbal warning in eight years arising out of some type of traffic stop or traffic incident, um, and that's his record. And so we come to this incident on July 28, 2017 with really no prior discipline against my client, and yet because of the events of that day, the City of Fargo, the Solid Waste Department, and its managers decide to terminate my client, even though the guidelines 
adopted by the city indicate that the first offense for instigating or provoking a fight, if that's what happened, and we indicate it certainly is not, that Mr. Eckrey instigated and provoked the fight, but even if it's true that Mr. Cockfield did that, the recommended discipline is unpaid suspension. It is not termination. So I'd ask, why is the city going outside its own guidelines? And I heard repeatedly it's the Civil Service Commission, oh, those are only guidelines. Those are only guidelines. We could ignore them if we want. Well, no, I, I mean, there's a purpose to guidelines. They should be followed unless there's an overwhelming reason why they shouldn't be. Um, so the recommended discipline for a fight is unpaid suspension. My client was terminated. The recommended discipline for failure to obey a direct order from a supervisor is number one, written warning, number two, suspension for a second offense. For a third offense, you'd be terminated. My client has never, prior to July 28, 2017, disobeyed a direct order, and yet he is fired. Why? Why are the guidelines being interpreted this way? Well, I think there is a reason, and I think it relates to the fact that my client is an African-American male because there's a history in this department of very racially intolerant, insensitive, and derogatory remarks toward Mr. Cockfield. Began within about a year of his arrival in the department. Um, two coworkers put on uh, sandbag hoods pretending to be KKK members. Uh, at one point later on, uh, one of his coworkers said to him, go back to your mud hut. Uh, two statues were placed in his vehicle, one in, once in a city vehicle, once in a personal vehicle, uh, which were very demeaning and very derogatory. He was present when a coworker said, have you ever seen a black man turn red? And then we come to July 28, 2017, when Sean Eckrey, after first asking a white coworker to do a job, and that white coworker saying, no, I, I, I don't have time, and then asking for a second white coworker to do the job, and being told, oh, he's, he's not around, when in fact he was around. So then we get down to Mr. Cockfield, and Mr. Cockfield says, no, these other two guys can do it. Why, why would you ask me to do it? Well, Mr. Eckery gets very upset. And after he learns that, in fact, the solid waste vehicle had been dumped, he marches into the break room a couple hours later at a very fast pace, his, his voice very loud, spittle flying from his mouth, marches across the break room, towering over Mr., um, Mr. Cockfield, and Mr. Cockfield stands up, and he puts out his hands, and he pushes back which is, I think, something that any of us in this room would do. Are you going to let a man approach you rapidly while you're in a seated position and just sit there? No, I don't think so. There's only one independent witness to this incident, and his name is Mark Steffens. And I don't see him here. He wasn't at the Civil Service Commission. I didn't have the power of subpoena. But you'll hear him tell Mr. Cockfield, Mr. Cockfield recorded it on his phone, and it's also in his written statement. Mr. Cockfield got up. He did not advance toward Mr. Eckery. The diagram that Mr. Ludlam prepared is simply incorrect, which is why I brought the photographs. This is a very small room. The computer station in question is right next to the table where Mr. Steffens was sitting. Mr. Steffens had a good view of everything. Uh, he's not being presented here, apparently, by the city, and, and that's his choice, not to appear. He can't be subpoenaed by either side. So, you have Mr. Eckrey walking rapidly across the room, shouting, cursing, why didn't you dump it? Why didn't you dump it? And Mr. Cockfield stands up and pushes him away. Mr. Cockfield's a big man. He's a strong man. He probably gave more of a push than he should have, and Mr. Eckrey stumbles backward and, uh, and falls down. My client didn't, you know, didn't use a weapon, didn't strike anybody with his fist, he pushed someone away in self-defense, and yet he's being fired. 
What about Mr. Eckrey? Mr. Eckrey wasn't suspended. He's the one who instigated this fight. I mean, this is a clear double standard, and I think it is based on race. Because what does Mr. Eckrey say after he stumbles and gets up? Now, I've got you, boy. I've got you now, boy. That suggests to me the word now indicates that this was premeditated, that Mr. Eckrey was looking for some excuse to get rid of Mr. Cockfield. And boy, my goodness, really? A supervisor for the city of Fargo is going to call an African-American male boy? And then he's going to pretend that he calls everyone boy? Which is just not true? Commissioners, I'm sorry, but this is not, this is not Fargo. This is not the way Fargo should treat its employees. It's, it speaks very poorly to our community. You have a history of racial discrimination and derogatory behavior toward my client, and this is the culmination. Both, both Mr. Eckery and Mr. Cockfield testified at the Civil Service Commission. Emotions ran high, things got a little bit out of hand. But that's no excuse to end a man's eight-year record with the city. That's not right. Let him serve in another department, give him an unpaid suspension, which the guidelines suggest might be appropriate if you think he instigated the fight. Don't terminate him. This is his livelihood. It's a job he loves, he enjoys, he's been good at it. Thank you. Nancy Morris. Thank you. Commissioners, um, before I commence my opening statement, I do have a number of documents that I would have submitted, but for your uh, decision not to accept the additional documents um, in response to, to the uh, civil service finding. Um, Mr. Cockfield was, in fact, had uh, written discipline um, on January 31st, 2011. And there were a number of incident reports that were discussed at the time of the civil service. And in fact, a couple of citizen complaints regarding Mr. Cockfield's actions. If you would uh, be willing to accept those now, I would, I would submit them. Otherwise, I can have uh, 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 Terry Ludlum uh, testify to those documents. Feeling of the commission? I think we have to be consistent and say if we didn't, uh use it for one side, we shouldn't for the other. So I think we'll just leave it Great. the way it was. We'll leave it as is. OK. And, that, and that's fine. I just wasn't sure if you were considering the other documents that had been submitted um, that it seemed appropriate to offer them now. Um, so again, I thank you for your time and attention to this matter. As you know, the city of Fargo takes disciplinary matters very seriously. The matter before you today is one that the Civil Service found that Mr. Cockfield was terminated with cause. It is one of physical violence in the workplace, which Mr. Ledlam will testify has never happened to his knowledge in the city of Fargo and should not be permitted now. This is coupled with a refusal to do the work and insubordination. Mr. Cockfield was terminated because he physically shoved his acting supervisor, Sean Eckery, without physical provocation, and he was verbally abusive to Mr. Eckery using profane and hostile language. And he, again, he refused to do the work in the, in the proper course of his duties. Um, briefly, Mr. Cockfield was in the break room on call to be dispatched as necessary. This is not an unusual circumstance in this situation. Mr. Eckery, who was acting route supervisor um, in Mr. Dave Rowe's absence uh, received a call from Household Hazardous Waste that there was a container there that needed to be dumped. He called back to the solid waste facility as he was out actually um, working with an injured patient and was at the hospital at the time. He called back to solid waste and inquired as to who might be available to do the work. He did learn that there was one individual who was washing his truck so he was otherwise engaged in work duties. And another individual was scheduled to be off in the very near future. So um, he said, but Aaron is here. And Aaron had been sitting in the break room for approximately an hour and a half to two hours, as I understand it, not otherwise engaged in work. So when the call came to him to do the work, he refused to do it in no uncertain terms. At that point, Mr. Eckery said, go empty the household 
hazardous waste container. He was not otherwise engaged in work. Mr. Eckery then uh, returned to the solid waste facility after um, working with the uh, injured employee, and he learned that someone else, in fact, did empty the hazardous household waste facility. Um, he then went into the break room, and yes, he did approach Mr. Cockfield and uh, ask him why, in fact, he did not engage in the work that was requested of him. And Mr. Cockfield, again, uh, engaged in verbal communication, saying, you're not my boss, I don't have to do that, and you can't tell me what to do. Mr. Eckery said, yes, I, in fact, I am your acting supervisor, and I asked you to complete the work, and you failed to do so. At that point, Mr. Eckery will, will testify that he was not standing over Mr. Cockfield, but that he had entered the room. Mr. Cockfield got up, approached him, and shoved him. Mr. Eckery fell back five to six feet into an open doorway. At the door frame stopped him from falling back even further and preventing injury. At that point, he did make a statement after, after the shove. That was after the shove. And although he now recognizes it was an inappropriate or may have been viewed as derogatory, he says he does not intend it in that way. Irregardless, it was after the shove and it was a significant shove. By Mr. Cockfield's account, he shoved him even harder. He says he was standing by the chair and shoved him all the way across the room. In any event, that is a violation of the workplace rules against violence. And as a result, Mr. Ludlam made the determination that termination of Mr. Cockfield's employment was appropriate and the civil service confirmed that determination and found that Mr. Cockfield was terminated for cause. And I ask that you review the evidence and make the same finding as the civil service. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cockfield, do you have any witnesses? Mr. Cockfield is his own witness. Does he want to make a statement now that is his opportunity? It's my understanding that if the rules are the same as they were in the Civil Service Commission, I'm allowed to ask my client questions to which he would respond. All I have on mind is employee witnesses at this time come forward. So if he's a witness, you can interview him. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cockfield, tell the commission, uh, where were you born and raised? <coughs> Baltimore, Maryland, Yonkers, um, John Hopkins Hospital. And uh, how much education do you have? Twelfth uh, grade graduate. And what brought you to Fargo, North Dakota? Well, my parents died when I was 13 years old, so my aunt came from New York to pick me up to give me a better life in New York City. So as a result of that, I obtained a job that had me making deliveries to American Express down where 9-11 took place. And that day, I didn't make it to work. And my mother-in-law came out here for, uh, to open up a child daycare program, and she got nervous, and me and my wife were still in New York City, so she begged us to come out here to start over again, because she didn't want to worry about us in that situation, which I would have been down at 9-11 if I would have went to work that day. And uh, you came out to Fargo in 2005? Yes, sir. And what was your first job here? Uh, driving tractor trailers for Aspen Excavation. Okay. And when did you join the Solid Waste Department of the City of Fargo? Uh, 31609. Okay. And what interested you or caused you to apply for that type of position? Well, it's an old movie you used to watch called Geraldine. James Earl Jones was a garbage man, and I always wanted to be a garbage man hanging on the back of the truck. It looked like it was so much fun and, you know, doing my duty at cleaning the world. And uh, you held a job as a solid waste department employee until August 22, 2017? Yes, sir. And did you enjoy your job? Yes, very much. You think you were good at your job? Excellent. Did you get pay raises along with other city employees every year? Yes, I did. Um, Mr. Cockfield, um, beginning early in your employment, were there unfortunate incidents involving racial comments or racial disparagement uh, directed toward you by coworkers in the department? Yes, there were when I first got there, and they also told me that there was nothing I would be able to do about it because they were all one and I was just by myself. So who are they going to believe, me or them? Okay. Was there an incident involving two coworkers who put on hoods to, uh, 
to represent themselves as members of the Ku Klux Klan? Yes, Donald McCracken and Steve Gustafson. And were those two co-workers, and what year was that, do you recall? That was in, it was 09, it was during the flood time, right after the flood. Okay. Did those two co-workers receive uh, discipline for their actions? Not that I know of, but they said they took care of it, so I couldn't find out what the disciplinary action was. Okay. Um, then, a year or so later, uh, was there another incident involving uh, items left in your vehicle, both your private vehicle and your city vehicle? Yes, sir. I mean, they both were unlocked because we would figure no one would come in the city and go through your car, so we would leave our vehicles unlocked, yes. And what was placed in the vehicles? There were uh, a bust of uh, African-American and wore the earrings and had the rings around their neck with the big protruding lips. And then it was a mammy-type looking doll that was placed in my uh, personal vehicle, too. So. And you still have those today, correct? Yes, sir, I do. And I asked if uh, I could borrow them, and you said I could, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, these are the items that were placed in your vehicle in 2010? Yes, sir. Then uh, let's move forward. Uh, was there an incident involving um, Mike, I'm sorry, Bliski, um, involving go back to your mud hut? Yes, sir, there was. Who was the employee in that incident? Uh, Mike Belinsky, I put my phone on a chair, and we was all having lunch, and it ringed, and he just was so annoyed that he came, and he kicked the chair. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he was like, just, I mean, he just went off. If you don't like it, why don't you go back to your mud hut? Um, <clears throat> then later, at some point in 2016, was there um, a incident in which a coworker made a comment about ever seeing a black man turn red? Yes, Dave Rowe came in and was telling us that as uh, far as you go into a doctor's appointment, we're going to start using vacation time to and from. And I was like, that sounds ridiculous. And one of the, uh, Jason Solem said, have you ever seen a black man turn red? And the guy next to him, I can't remember who it was, just started laughing. And I asked Dave, did he hear what he said? And Dave was like, yes. But then they changed the whole thing around again. I lost because I'm by myself. I don't have no one to help defend me. In, um, in the summer of 2016, then, did you bring um, a, a number of these incidents to the attention of uh, human resources, um, including Jill Manette, the director, and also your supervisors, and also Mr. Ludlam? Yes, I did. Yeah. And uh, was Mr. Ludlam upset that you hadn't uh, kind of gone through the chain of hierarchy, uh, starting with your immediate supervisor and going up from there? Yes, I was under the assumption that we all were on the same page. So I sent at the same time as I sent to Mr. Ludlam the thing that I written up. So everyone got it at the same time. I go in the office, this will never happen again. This will never, and I'm like, what are you talking about? You will never embarrass me like this again. So Mr. Ludlam was upset with you? Yes. And you filed an EEOC complaint related to the events that summer? Yes. And Mr. Ludlam was named in that complaint? Yes, he was, which he later apologized for. But So let's uh, go to the events of July 28, 2017. Um, why don't you tell the commission what happened, beginning with a call coming in from Mr. Eckery to uh, uh, to one of your coworkers. Yes, he was trying to call Tanner on the two-way, and Tanner was wiping his truck down. And me, Gregor, and Mark were sitting in the, the lunchroom. So Mr. Eckery called Mr. Gregor on his personal phone, which we all share the same phone. We, you know, stay in touch with each other because sometimes you can't get each other on the two-way. He calls Gregor, and then Gregor is telling him where Tanner is out in the shop, said he was getting ready to leave. This time, I think it was about 2.35. And Gregor was working for someone else at that time, which the guy leaves at 3.30, so Gregor had plenty of time. So he went out in the shop and gave Tanner the phone. Tanner comes back in and hands me the phone. I said, I don't want that phone. So I could hear Mr. Eckery screaming on the background, go dump HHW. I said, no, I'm not, because you just told these two guys to go do it. He goes, get off your fucking ass and go dump, excuse my language, and go dump the, the container. I said, no, I'm definitely not doing it. So at that time, those two went back out, and I heard a truck start. 
So about an hour later, Mr. Eckery comes back in. So apparently they went and dumped what he told them to do first. So I figured if Mr. Eckery had to call and tell me, he would have called me on my personal phone, which we do have each other's numbers. Anyway, Mr. Eckery comes in at that time as his statement says that Tanner told him that it was already dumped. So he comes in and approached me. Did you dump it? I said, no, I didn't. He says, why you didn't dump it? I said, because you told these two guys to go dump it. Oh, you think you can just do what you want around here? At that time, he's coming towards me, and I'm looking like I've never seen him act like this. And that's when I stood up, and I was trying to protect myself as he's spitting, and I pushed him away from me. And Mark jumped in between us, and as he went against the wall, he said, well, I got you now, boy. I got you now. I said, what you mean you got me now? And you calling me a boy? And Mark was like, you guys break it up. And Mr. Eckery went out in the hallway. Okay, it was Mr. Mark Steffens. Was he the only individual in the room then other than you at the time Mr. Eckery approached you? Yes, he was. Was Mr. Eckery approaching you at a rapid pace? Yes. Was his voice raised? Yes, it was. Was there spittle coming out of his mouth? Yes, it was. And... He approached you fast and you stood up. Yes. Did you take any steps toward him? No, I did not. I couldn't. He came so fast and abruptly on me. This is before I knew it. He was standing directly in my face. Yeah. Um, so to the extent that Mr. Ludlam's diagram, which is an exhibit before this commission, shows you walking nine feet toward Mr. Eckery, that's simply not true. No, it's not. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Eckery testified before the Civil Service Commission that he has a habit of calling people boy, whether they're white or black or Indian or Mexican or whatever. And I don't recall exactly how he characterized it, whether it's just a, jo a joking term or a term of endearment or whatever. Um, have you worked with Mr. Eckery on a regular basis in the last eight years? Yes, I would say most times we're working seven days a week because we work weekends together too. I've never heard him jokingly, any shape, form, saying the word boy. Um, after this incident on July 28, uh, because Mr. Steffens was the only person in the room at the time, did you go over to his house and ask him what happened? Yes, I did. He made a video for me, too. Yeah, I'd like to play that for the commission. <clears throat> May I ask you whether this president at the previous hearing, the video? Yes, we've seen it. It was presented to the Civil Service. So I'm sorry, Jill, it's the one on the far right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Mark, can you tell me what happened that day? Okay. Uh, I wrote a statement at work. Everything's on that. But from what I saw, after a heated debate, uh, Sean started walking toward you. You were sitting in your chair. You got up and you pushed him with both hands on his chest, pushed him hard backwards, five, six feet into the wall. You, you were sitting in your, in your chair. That's Mr. Grinberg wanted to know who that was? Uh, Mark Steffens. Mark Steffens. So, Mr. Cockfield, um, you've just heard Mr. Steffens in the video saying you were sitting in your chair, and he didn't say that you walked toward Mr. Eckery, did he? No, he did not. And then, as part of the City's exhibits, Exhibit 7. Um, this is a written statement by Mr. Stephens. And he says, in part, Aaron got up out of his chair and used both hands to Sean's chest to push him back about five to six feet into the wall. He doesn't say anywhere in this statement that you advanced toward Mr. Eckery. No, I did not. And had you ever refused a direct order from a supervisor prior to July 28, 2017? No, I have not, because if usually the supervisor, Dave or Jennifer Pickett, they would call me on my phone to tell me their self what would they like for me to do. And of 
course you have to do it. It's your, it's your job. So he's never really told me a direct order. He gave the phone to those two guys, and they tried to – I thought they was trying to pass the buck, basically. Most of the guys are trying to get out of work around there. So. Okay. One of the city's exhibits is from a uh, Patrick England. That's exhibit number nine. And Mr. – I'm sorry, Patrick English. And he says, I, Patrick English, who witnessed the incident on July 28th, did you have a conversation with Mr. English shortly after this incident on July 28th? Yes, we, we met in the shop, and uh, he was looking at me. I said, did you see what happened in there? He says, well, no, I didn't. I came at the end of it. That's what he told me. Do you believe, Mr. Cockfield, if you're reinstated to the solid waste department, either in the department you were working or a different division, maybe at the landfill or elsewhere, you could work professionally and, and uh, cooperatively with your coworkers? Yes, I most definitely can, because most of us are in our own vehicle. We barely have contact with each other in the morning. How you doing? Cup of coffee. Everybody goes their separate ways. You don't even have to have lunch together. You can stop someplace else. So you really don't have too much dealings with each other. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Nancy Morris, you have witnesses. Thank you. Yes, I do. I would like to start with uh, Terry Ludlum. Um, Terry, what is your position with Solid Waste? I'm the Solid Waste Utility Director. And how long have you held that position? I have held that position working on 12 years, and I have been uh, working with the City of Fargo going on 28 years. Okay. Are you the appointing authority in the Solid Waste Division of the City of Fargo? Yes, I am. And you are vested with uh, the hiring and firing decisions primarily? That is correct. Okay. Why did you decide to terminate Aaron Cockfield's employment with the City of Fargo? Aaron Cockfield was terminated with the City of Fargo uh, because he shoved a supervisor, and that was a violation of the City of Fargo's workplace violence policy. Did your investigation disclose any facts that Mr. Cockfield was acting in self-defense? No. Okay. Now let's turn to that investigation. Um, how did you first become aware of an incident that occurred on July 28, 2017? Um, I was informed in our uh, uh, daily supervisor meeting on Monday morning that there was an incident uh, between uh, Mr. Cockfield and Mr. Eckery. Uh, Mr. Eckery had called uh, Dave Rowe on Friday night, uh, somewhat after the incident, and said, that uh, there had been an altercation in the driver's room. And when Mr. Rowe told me that on uh, Monday morning, I said, okay, let's see if we can catch up with Sean, see if we can get some more of the story and find out what happened. The reason that um, I said catch up with Sean is because Sean then was on a different shift. Normally his shift is 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And so Dave and Sean normally don't cross paths a lot during the day uh, when they're on uh, the different shifts. So I asked Dave then, uh, could you uh, catch up with Sean and let's find out what was going on. Um, I didn't hear anything back then. Um, the next morning, uh, Mr. Rowe and I got together again for a supervisor meeting, said, did you talk to Sean at all? And he goes, no, I didn't, I didn't end up seeing him. And I said, okay, I'm going to be out of the office for the next day or two. Uh, what I'd like to do is get a written statement from Mr. Eckery, get a written statement from Mr. Cockfield, find out if there was anyone else that saw the incident or that knew of the incident. And I said, get written statements and let's find out what's going on. Um, at that same time then, uh, we called Human Resources and said that uh, we, we had an incident, an altercation in the driver's room. We don't know a lot of, uh, we don't know a lot of the details, but uh, we're gathering written information from all of these folks. Okay. And so, you, uh, so Dave Rowe undertook an investigation and did talk to a number of witnesses and received statements from those witnesses. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I'm first going to kind of walk through what you understand, and I'm going to go up to the podium to do that. Okay, so Terry, from, from uh, your understanding of the investigation, uh, Mr. Eckery entered the room down toward the lower left hand there, there's a door there. Is that your understanding, correct? That, that's correct. Okay. And he walked toward the table that is near the middle of the room. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. 
And so where the S is here, is that where Mr. Eckery, or yeah, Mr. Eckery stopped? His, his That's what I understand is when Sean entered the room, he walked up to the table and they were having their discussion then as to uh, whether the work had been completed or not. Okay. And as you understand it, Mr. Cockfield is sitting at a computer station looking at the news on a computer there waiting to be dispatched for work. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so Mr. Eckery enters the room. Mr. Cockfield stands up and, to, to the best of your understanding, in fact, did approach Mr. Eckery and at this point here is, a, is where there's a confrontation that takes place. To the best of my knowledge, and that was based on uh, Mr. Steffen's statement that he pushed him five to six feet, um, and he pushed him there over into the other doorway, which would be just to the left. And so uh, that was why I put the asterisk there, because that kind of defined the five to six feet, as opposed to the width of the room, which would have been uh, 11 or 12 feet. Okay, so there is a doorway um, that isn't identified on this document that's about right where I have the cursor, is that correct? I think if you scroll up just a little bit, it'll show there. Oh, okay, sorry. Just, 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 just below that is the actual doorway. Okay, yep. so this area here is about five to six feet that he fell back. That's correct. Okay, and uh, is it your understanding that there was another individual standing by this door at the time of the incident? That's correct. Okay, and who, do you recall who that, who that was? That was Pat English. Okay, and Pat English had entered the doorway, but maybe not had entered the room and was standing behind Mr. Eckery, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so he indicated to you, or in the written statement, that he in fact had seen the altercation that took place between Mr. Eckery and Mr. Cockfield. He indicated to Mr. Rowe then when... Uh, when Mr. O was asking for statements, written statements, Mr. English indicated to him that I saw the incident and I would also like to submit a written statement. Okay, thank you. Do you know if Mr. Eckery had anything in his hands as he uh, approached Mr. Cockfield? Uh, Mr. Eckery said that he'd just gotten back in. Uh, again, he'd been taken care of by an injured operator, and he got back in uh, to the office, and he had walked into the meeting room there, and he had a radio in one hand, and he had a set of route maps in his other hand. Okay. Thank you. Do you know if Mr. Cockfield said anything to Mr. Eckery, like back off or move away or anything in those? I don't believe so. I didn't get that in any of the statements, the witness statements. Okay. Thank you. Um, are you involved in establishing the chain of command? Yes, I am. Okay. And are you aware that Mr. Rowe was on vacation uh, during the week in question? Yes. Had he been on vacation that entire week? Yes, he had. Okay. And what is the chain of command when Mr. Rowe is, is on vacation? Uh, the next uh, the person that is the acting supervisor uh, is uh, Sean Eckery. It takes over from the uh, route collection standpoint. And how long has Mr. Eckery been acting in that capacity? Um, at least five years. Every time Dave was gone, uh, there was another gentleman that used to do that, and he retired about five years ago, and Sean is filled in uh, each time then that Dave is on vacation. And is there actually a, a physical turning over of the um, office space for keys for that uh, chain of command? Yes, and one thing that I ask Dave to do anytime that he's going to be gone is to um, come up with um, um, a route assignments for all the different workers and make sure that he's visiting with Sean about what equipment or there may be issues with or any special requests and then he turns over the keys to the office. Okay, and were you aware that uh, Mr. Eckery had sought uh, for Mr. Cockfield to engage in work while he was in the break room? Yes. And do you understand the uh, explanations given by the other workers as to why they did not engage in the work? I do. Um, I, I, Sean called back to the break room knowing that there'd be some folks in the break room. And when he asked Mr. Gregor right away, uh, uh, can you go dump this out at Household Hazardous Waste? Uh, Bob informed him that, you remember, I started my shift this morning at 7 o'clock, so I'm going to be getting, getting off in a half an hour. And Sean said, I, I forgot about that. Is anybody else there? He said, I think Tanner's out washing his truck. Okay, you know, I, I don't know if he went out and talked with Tanner then or came back. 
And he asked, is there anybody else in the break room? And he said, uh, Mr. Cockfield is in the break room. And then what happened? And, and then I, they handed him the phone and said, uh, Aaron, go dump household hazardous waste. And I think at that point in time, uh, Mr. Cockfield became verbally abusive with Mr. Eckery and, and on certain terms said, I'm not doing that. Okay. Um, so through your investigation and the statements that you received, um, do you believe that Mr. Cockfield violated the uh, policy, um, work and ethics, policy, conduct ethics for failing to refu or refusing to do the work? Yes, he did. Okay. Do you also um, believe and understand that Mr. Cockfield viol violated the workplace violence policy? Yes, he did. Okay. Are you aware of any other instances of physical altercations in your workplace during your employment with the City of Fargo? While I was undergoing my investigations, um, I kind of sat and visited with a couple of the long-term folks at Solid Waste. Uh, Dave Rowe, who's now the route supervisor, has been with the division for about 34 years. And I asked him, Dave, have you ever seen, we, we, have you ever seen this type of violence in the workplace before? Have you ever seen uh, this type of act taking place in the Solid Waste Division? He goes, no, I never have. And so the next morning then, I was having my meeting with the landfill supervisor, and I just, Paul Hansen, and I asked him, Paul, how many years have you been with the city? And he said, 40 years. And I said, with all the landfill groups, have you ever seen it actually turn into a, a, a physical altercation between those in disagreement? And he said, absolutely not. Okay. Did you consider suspension as a means of discipline under the circumstances? Initially, um, I did consider suspension um, until I started seeing some of the witness statements come back. Um, there was a couple of things that were a real cause of concern for me. Um, number one was um, how quickly Mr. Cockfield um, became verbally abusive, uh, both as stated by Bob Greger, the witnesses when he was on the phone, say, um, you know, saying that he didn't have to do the work and just, you know, F you, F you, F you, I don't have to do that. And then how he, how he escalated it then into into the assault on Mr. Eckery. And so those caused me concern. And as soon as I read those statements, um, I knew that suspension wasn't, uh, wasn't the adequate means and that, uh, and that uh, termination was. One of my major concerns is that all of our operators at Solid Waste Division, uh, as Mr. Cockfield stated, they do show up in the morning and then they're out in the community for the rest of the day. And when they're out in the community, they're interacting with the public on an ongoing basis, whether they're a residential route supervisor or a commercial service, or in Mr. Cockfield's case, he was servicing all the 27 drop sites throughout the community. And so on an ongoing basis, you're interacting with the public. There may be questions of you. There may be other folks that are using those sites when you're there. And so once I read the statements and saw the degree of the verbal abuse and then the physical violence uh, part of it, I really lost all the trust that I need to have from my staff and my operators when they're going out into the general public. And that's why I decided that termination was the appropriate means. Has Mr. Cockfield been uh, reprimanded or disciplined in the past for conduct in the public? We had received one statement from a uh, person in one of the mobile home parks. Uh, she wrote a, uh, a, a statement stating that there was a verbal altercation between her and Mr. Cockfield. There was a, somewhat of a, a disagreement. There was some road construction going on in the mobile home park, and there was disagreement as to who had the right of way. And when she drove by then uh, uh, and asked what was going on or something, Mr. Cockfield became verbally abusive to her, and she sent uh, an email into our office and. And we sat down with Mr. Cockfield and discussed that with him, and, and he stated that he was lying about the incident. And he also has been, so did he in fact, does the email indicate that he used a cuss word when he was in conversing with, with her? That's what the email stated, yes. Okay. And in 2011, you also had incidents regarding, um, that were a cum accumulation of a number of incident reports with his driving, is that correct? That's correct. He was, given a, uh, he was given a letter of disciplinary action then for violating safety rules, safety practices for some of his um, driving habits. Okay. So Mr. Cockfield has, in fact, been disciplined in the past? Yes, he has. Okay. 
Um, has Mr. Cockfield raised issues with you in the past um, regarding racial discrimination and harassment? Yes, he has. Okay. Um, first off, I'll ask you, have you ever seen the items that uh, Mr. Wilking placed on the table today? I have never seen those. Okay. So Mr. Cockfield did not bring these items to you um, at any time? Never. Okay. Um, but he has brought incidents of uh, his concerns with discrimination and harassment in the workplace to you in the past, correct? Yes. Okay. And what did you do then? Each and every incident was handled like we handle all incidents at the Solid Waste Division. Uh, there's first an incident report that's written up. We ask for their findings. We ask for the dates. We ask for witnesses that are there. We ask for statements. We go out and we investigate. We discuss it with other employees that may have been there. Um, we bring in human resources immediately. Um, as soon as the incident report is prepared, that's forwarded down to human resources, and we begin to look into it. Uh, we discuss it with everyone involved. Um, if there's discipline that's required, and there has been, based on some of those um, the allegations and the results, there have been discipline, disciplinary actions based on those. Um, it's, it's, all of it is based on information and input through and with the Human Resource Department. Um, and then Mr. Cockfield was informed uh, that we had looked into every situation. Um, what Mr. Cockfield never agreed with is he wanted to know how the person was disciplined, and I never thought that that was information to share with other employees. Okay, so on a number of incidents, and most of what Mr. Cockfield has raised today have been specifically addressed by the City of Fargo as evidenced in the correspondence from uh, Ms. Manette, Jill Manette, in Exhibits 15 and 16. Is that correct? That is correct, and we had met with Mr. Cockfield and presented both of those letters to him and asked if he was satisfied with the findings of those letters. So was race an issue in your decision making uh, to terminate Mr. Cockfield for the workplace violence? No, it was not. It was the violent act. Thank you. I have no further questions of Mr. Ludlam. I would like to um, next call Mr. Sean Eckery uh, for just to respond to a few questions. So, Mr. Eckery, if you could uh, state your name and your position with the City of Fargo, please. Uh, Sean Eckery, commercial truck driver. And how long have you been employed with the City of Fargo? 36 years. Okay. Um, what is your role as the acting supervisor in Dave's Ro Dave Rowe's absence? When he's gone, I pretty much do what he does. Okay. Does he leave you a schedule and assignment? Yes, he does. Okay. Does he actually give you the keys to his office? Yep. Okay, and do you then, um, are you responsible for making the work assignments um, in his absence? Yep. Okay, so when a call comes in from household hum uh, a hazardous waste, it wouldn't be unusual for you to, to uh, reach out to personnel at Solid Waste to determine who would be available? Happens every day. Okay. Um, and so there is no question in your mind that Mr. Cockfield knew that you were the acting supervisor on that day, question, oh, yeah, correct? Every, everybody knows. Okay. And in fact, you had been acting supervisor for that entire week. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So um, can you just uh, tell me a little bit about what happened uh, in the commission in accordance with our testimony at civil service? what happened on the afternoon of Friday, July 28th. Were you engaged in um, uh, attending to an injured worker at that time? Yes, I was. Okay. Did you then receive a call from Household Human Waste, or Hazardous Waste, excuse me? Yeah, they had a full container. They wanted it empty before the weekend. Okay. And you called back to Solid Waste to see who might be available to do that? Right. Okay. Did you determine that Aaron Cockfield was, in fact, available and not otherwise engaged in work when uh, you called back to Solid Waste? Yes. Okay. And did Mr. Cockfield tell you he would not empty that container? Uh, uh, he said there was no way he was going to empty that container. Okay. Did you um, then return to the Solid Waste facility? Yep. Okay. Um, when you returned to Solid Waste, what did you learn? 
I, I heard that he didn't dump the container, so I just asked him why not. Okay. Can you explain to the, the commission how it was that you entered the, the break room, the, the uh, diagram is still up on, on the screen there. You entered from the door on the, on the lower left, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And did you stop somewhere near the table? Yeah, that, the table was pushed up a little farther towards the, what is that, a number nine there? But I stopped right about where that asterisk is, and he met me right there. He walked three, four steps, met me right there. He said he's going to call Jennifer on this problem, and I says go right ahead. And that must have hit a hit a nerve because then he pushed me like that right back into the wall. Then he stood there like this, and he says, "Come on." And at that point, Mark Steffitz um, intervened. Right. Okay. So Mr. Cockfield was seated when you entered the room. Yeah. You entered the room to ask him why he didn't engage in the work that you had directed him to do so. Okay. He, did, did he push you pretty hard? Well, yeah, when you're not expecting anything like that, yeah. Okay, so you were surprised by the yeah. physical contact. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't think he'd do something like that. Okay. Did you have anything in your hands at the time? Two-way radio and, and the route sheets in the other hand. Did, uh, Mr. Did you say anything to Mr. Cockfield that would indicate that you intended uh, physical violence against him? No. Okay. And did you, um, did Mr. Cockfield say anything to you to de-escalate the situation? No. No. So unprovoked, uh, Mr. Cockfield shoved you across the room? Yep. Um, did you make a statement to Mr. Cockfield after the shove? I just said, I got you for pushing me, boy. The boy wasn't uh, racially intended. He knows that. Okay. Have you worked with Mr. Cockfield um, quite frequently over the years? Well, a lot of times, yeah. We, we both work weekends most of the time, every month. Okay. And you have not had a, an acrimonious or, or difficult working relationship with Mr. Cockfield, correct? No, not at all. Okay. Do you understand now that the term boy may be viewed as racially derogatory? I, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't mean it that way. Okay. But you have been counseled in, in the use of that term. Yeah. Correct? but you did not intend for it to be racially derogatory? Not at all. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions, Mr. Hickory. And one, one final witness that we did present at civil service was Mr. Rowe, and uh, I have the, would like to call him for the limited purposes of establishing the chain of command. and his investigation. So Dave Rowe, um, could you please state your name and your title with the solid waste? Uh, Dave Rowe, route supervisor, solid waste. And how long have you been the route supervisor? Uh, about nine years. Okay, how long have you been employed with the city of Fargo? 34. Okay, have you ever um, had any experience with an actual altercation or workplace violence while working with solid waste? No. Okay. What is your responsibility as, as route supervisor? Uh, setting out daily routes uh, for the commercial, residential, uh, helping with the recycling route scheduling. Okay. Filling personnel spots. Okay. You were out um, the week, uh, during the week in question on July 28th, correct? Correct. Okay. And you had actually turned over the keys and confirmed that Sean Eckery was acting route supervisor during that time? Yes. Okay. Um, you heard testimony as to how it came that Mr. Cockfield was asked to, to empty the household hazardous waste container. Is that something that would be the usual practice? Uh, yes, it was uh, actually witnessed by, when the pictures were taken, <coughs> excuse me, by an employee, we had a, we had the same scenario with the way day he took the pictures. 
I actually handed duties off to a guy that day coming in from the road. So. Okay. So it wouldn't be unusual for Mr. Eckery to have called back to Solid Waste to determine who might be available and best suited to complete this work. No, we're on a on-call basis all day long. Okay. And from your understanding, Mr. Cockfield um, should have completed the work as it was assigned to him. Correct. Okay. Did uh, Mr. Eckery then um, contact you after the incident that took place in the break, break room that day? He did. He called me about 8 p.m. that night. Okay. And uh, what did he tell you? Just that him and Aaron had gotten a little conflict in the driver's room and he was shoved back and wanted to discuss it Monday. Okay. Did you then, um, the following week, undertake an investigation uh, at uh, Mr. Ludlum's direction as to the events that occurred in that break room? Yes, we did. Okay. And did you secure the uh, written statements that are part of the civil service record um, from Mr. Gregor, Mr. English, and um, Mr. Stephens? Yes. Okay. Did you also make a written statement from Mr. Stephens um, after you spoke to him? Yes, I did, correct. Okay. And did you understand from Mr. Stephens that uh, uh, he was surprised by the amount of force that uh, Mr. Cockfield used against Mr. Eckery? Mark kept stressing that he couldn't believe that Sean didn't have bruises on his chest with the force that was put there. Okay. And from your understanding, um, Mr. Stephens was in a position to, to see the incident that occurred as he was sitting at the table? He described it to a T. I mean, getting up, moving towards Sean, everything. So, Aaron, the statement indicates Aaron exited the chair, meeting Sean at the table, and shoved him back five feet. Is that your understanding of Mr. Stephens' testimony? That is correct. Okay. And Pat English witnessed, witnessed that to 100% too, the Aaron exiting the chair when we talked. So. Okay, and Pat English statement is exhibit number nine, and your summary of your um, interview with Mr. Stevens is exhibit number 10. So exhibit number nine, Pat English, was he in the doorway at the time that the incident took place? Yes, he witnessed the whole thing, too. Okay. And it's his understanding that Mr. Cockfield uh, violently shoved Mr. Eckery into the uh, doorway behind him. Correct. Okay. Have you been involved um, in the past in uh, addressing complaints that Mr. Cockfield has brought regarding racial discrimination and harassment? Yes, anything to be brought to me would be brought to Terry and followed up on. Okay, and um, to the best of your knowledge, the city has undertaken investigations of those complaints and taken action as appropriate, is that correct? Yes. Okay. I have no further questions of, of Mr. Rowe. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, at this time you'll be question the employee or the employee witnesses at this time. Questions? I have a couple Pepper. questions. First, for Mr. Cockfield, first of all, did you know that Sean Eckery was your supervisor at that time? Yes, I did. And so when he told you to do that, why didn't you do what he told you to do? Because he didn't tell me directly. He told those two guys on the phone to tell me when, in fact, I said he had my phone number. He should have called me. I thought that they were trying to pass the buck. So I never spoke to Mr. Eckery directly, which I can't understand him being a supervisor. He should know you got to come tell the guy yourself because, you know, these guys like to play a lot of games around there. But if he had another issue, maybe it was an injured fellow employee or something like that, if he couldn't be there, that isn't uncommon that he would, I mean, if one person couldn't do it, that he could give you instructions without having to do it personally. Isn't, hasn't that happened before? No, they usually call you direct. Like he called Gregor, he could have called me instead of calling Gregor, okay. you know? Okay. 
Thank you. And then just a couple more. So in 2009, when you had the issue, you know, where they did you did you report that immediately? The the racial issue. Did you report that immediately? No. Again, because they told me when I first got there, it's them against me. So. I mean, who am I going to report it to like it was going to fall on deaf ears? But I did report it eventually. Okay. But it's just at that time, I just figured I had no wins. Okay. I, I guess my main thing, and then uh, Mr. Wilkin referred to this as a fight. Obviously, this wasn't a fight. Do you want to correct that statement? This wasn't a fight, was it? I'm sorry. Are you asking me? or? What yeah. I'm asking you, you, you referred to it as a fight. I referred to it as a fight? Yeah. Absolutely not. I don't recall doing so when yeah. I, I No, you did. It. This, it isn't a fight when, when somebody assaults your supervisor. That's not a fight. Uh, Commissioner Correct? Tipcorn, it's not, a, it's not a fight, nor was it an assault. It was well, an act, no, no, no. It was no. an act of self-defense. Uh, you you stood called up and pushed someone away. I, I'm just asking you, that's what you said in your initial comments, that it was a fight, and I don't believe that it was. And when you when your supervisor tells you to do something and you don't do it and then you push him, that's an assault. Isn't that correct? No. All right. All right. That's the end of my question. Not, not if he's approaching you rapidly and standing over you. I, you would do the same thing, Commissioner Pepcorn. I believe you would. I would no, do the same thing. No, don't tell me what I would do. Well, and I'm, don't assume what I would do. But I'm just telling you, uh, when when a supervisor tells you to do something and then you push him against a wall. Uh, that's not a good combination. That's just my that's just my opinion. That's right. the end of my question. Mr. Right. Grinberg. I just have one question. It's regarding the Civil Service Commission. I'd like to know the backgrounds uh, and the members of the Civil Service Commission. I know Ms. Mrs. Pettinger is chair. Um, yes, I'm chair, and my background is in human resource management. I'm a, a certified senior professional in human resource management, which basically means I'm old and I've done it a long time. I've been the chair for a couple of terms now. Um, I was originally asked to serve on the commission by Bruce Furness, so I'm on my third mayor. That occurred to me earlier today. Um, the other members of the commission, two of them were here, um, and one is still here, Kurt Losey. And, you know, I don't know that I could accurately name all their backgrounds. Um, Jill, maybe you could do that better than I. Um, the other one who was present earlier is Paul Grinberg. The other members are Nancy Jardheim and Mike Winas. And they, and they have various uh, business owners and HR background. Nancy was the HR director for the city uh, schools. And that's where my, my interest is. Obviously, there's two sides of this, and um, the evidence speaks for themselves. But I'd like to know the, the background of the civil service, because you guys are in an uh, important work, and I'd like to know a little more of the background. So, um. Yes, yeah, so Jane, you had it. You stated it correctly and as accurately as I will be able to. The, Nancy Jordheim was the... Uh, HR director for Fargo Public Schools prior to her retirement. Uh, Kurt Losey and Paul Grinlin are managers uh, within their organizations as well and have that management history. Um, I don't have the exact current title for you, but, but they both have uh, management experience in their background. And Mike Wenis uh, serves as a financial manager with the organization that he's currently with. And just an uh, additional question then, how do you reach consensus? Is it by vote? Um, is it yes, when it you is make by, a decision? It is by vote, and I'm sure the reason we're here today is because the vote was not 5-0, it was 3-2. Um, so there was some disagreement as to whether or not termination was called for, in this case, by the commissioners. Um, more obviously voted to uphold than did not. Um, but, you know, if I were, if I were uh, counsel for the... Uh, Mr. Cockfield, I too would have appealed because of that vote. Thank you. Any other questions of the appointing authority, Nancy Morris' side? Any questions of those witnesses or those people? I just have one question for Jane. Is the uh, ultimate majority ruled in this area because of the violence? Well, I can tell you my own vote was to uphold, and it was because of the combination of profanity, violence, and lack of following the work order. It was a, it was a cumulative thing. Uh, personally, I, I'm much harder on letting people go than, than what the city is. I usually think the city has waited too long. I think the investigation on this case was very thorough. I think the amount of time it took was probably appropriate to reach the conclusions they did, but I would have had them out of there that day if I had been in charge. 
So we come down to final two items will happen is we'll have a final statement by the employee, we'll have a final statement by Nancy Morris, and then the commission will discuss it before us. Commissioner Pepcorn. Can I ask a couple of questions of uh, Terry Ludlam? If is that Yeah, is that, you can I any questions? Right? So so Terry, so Sean was the acting supervisor and, and that it had happened many times before, is that correct? That is correct. And so this wasn't something unique where the other employees didn't know that he was the acting supervisor? Absolutely not. And in fact, part of Sean's duties then is every morning to meet with the drivers in the driver's room to give them all assignments. And then I, I had a question. So do we have like a file? So if, if he had issues, are there, are there things in his personnel file? Uh, it, 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 are the, are, do you have those? Are they in, included in here? I would maybe a reference or refer that to, to Jill. I'm not sure what exactly what was submitted. So they just said there were past issues. Like he, he inter are those in a in a permanent file somewhere? Or? Yes. So we maintain a personnel file within the Human Resources Office where those items ultimately end up. The department has a departmental file where incident reports, uh, citizen complaints, uh, those types of items would land as well. So when we have both both of those locations where the documents are stored, uh, I, there isn't a copy of the personnel file or the departmental file in its entirety in what was submitted to you by either party. Uh, but there are exhibits that are pulled from those files uh, in, in both submissions. So can I ask, Mr. Chair, can, can I ask, so there were some of these incidents that were mentioned today. Do you have uh, the past records of those that we could see those? Uh, like there was one mentioned a lady in a trailer park had a verbal confrontation. Do you have that in a personnel file? So yes, between the departmental file or the personnel file, we do have those documents on file. Uh, the, I believe the specific incident report you're referring to uh, because it was not submitted for the Civil Service Commission, I don't believe it was submitted for today. And Nancy can probably so, address that. I believe that's... Ma well, maybe you can clar clarify this. Is, would it be possible to see his personnel file, or is that something kind of beyond our scope? And, and again, that is something that the uh, mayor determined that the... Uh, documents that were presented to civil service would be presented at the time of this hearing again without new materials or witnesses so that you're reviewing the civil service determination um, as to whether or not the termination was for cause. Again, if you wish to, to expand that record, um, I do have actually copies of, of some of those documents at this time. I am not suggesting or recommending that you do that right. it's just it's uh, they are available um, but really what the the reason for the termination um, is before you is the workplace violence and the insubordination and uh, those documents were submitted for your review okay I'm, I'm clear and I apologize for that I just wanted to uh, I'm not that bright, so it sometimes takes, but, but that's, we're, we're just looking at one thing, and so I just wanted to make sure, so I apologize for no, that. That's fine. Thank you. So Aaron Cockrell, do you get to make a final statement if you'd like? Uh, I'm allowed to make the statement on my client's behalf. If you'd like. Yes. However, however you two have worked it out. Thank you, Mayor <clears throat> Mahoney. Um, so we have a record which indicates um, documented racial prejudice and uh, derogatory behavior toward my client over a period of several years, a number of incidents. Um, we didn't hear Mr. Eckery say today that he calls everybody boy. He didn't seem to think he'd repeat that testimony from the Civil Service Commission. He testified that he had no idea that that would be interpreted in the way that I think any of us would interpret it. I'm sorry, I don't find that credible. Any adult white male in this country knows that referring to an African-American male as boy is evidence of racial bias and prejudice and should never be used. Never. And so when a supervisor says, I got you now, boy, what does that suggest to the commission? To me, it suggests that Mr. Eckrey was looking for something to provoke a fight. He succeeded in provoking, well, and Mr. Pipcorn has reminded me that apparently I used the word fight. It wasn't a fight. My client stood up and pushed. 
And Mr. Pipcorn says, I shouldn't speak for him in saying what he would do. Well, I'm sorry. I think 99% of the people in this country, if someone advances rapidly toward them and they're in a seated position, they're not going to stay seated. They're going to stand up as a means of self-defense. Now, would they push? Would they, would they walk backwards? I don't know. But Mr. Cockfield felt threatened. And that's in the statement that Mr. Steffens submitted. He says, Aaron then talked to me on how he felt threatened and used the word boy so many times. If Mr. Cockfield felt threatened by Mr. Eckrey's actions, why wouldn't he stand up and push him away? It's unfortunate he pushed him a little bit harder maybe than he should have, but this was not a fight. This was not assault. This was not workplace violence. My client didn't take a hammer to Mr. Eckrey. He didn't hit him with a two by four. You know, we have a clear dispute as to what happened. The one witness, the one independent witness, is not here today. City apparently, I don't know, didn't ask him, didn't want him, couldn't persuade him, whatever. Mark Steffens isn't here. The language that Ms. Morris read to you is not from Mr. Steffens. It's from Mr. Rowe's summary of what he was told by Mr. Steffens. Mr. Steffens said on the video and says in his statement that Mr. Cockfield stood up from his chair. That's what he did. He didn't walk toward Eckery. And then, you know, again, you know, I find it ironic that Mr. Ludlam would say, oh, I was concerned about public safety. Well, it's not in the evidence before you, but if Mr. Pipcorn or anybody else wanted to go look at the records, there have been a number of solid waste employees who've been found to have been drinking on the job, DUI, whatever. They still have their jobs. Driving city vehicles under the influence of alcohol? Is that a danger to the public? I think so. Had my client ever had an altercation with a member of the public? Never. Never. So because of the events during, you know, five minute span on July 28, 2017, my client loses a job he'd had for seven and a half, eight years, when the guidelines say at most he should have been suspended. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. I think it was based on improper considerations, namely race. I'm not saying Mr. Ludlam's a racist. I'm saying that the department itself apparently took this hostile attitude toward Mr. Cockfield and wanted him out. And they finally succeeded. That's all I have. Thank you. And thank you again for your time and attention to, to this employ important employment matter. Um, the Fargo City Ordinance 70305 indicates that an employee may be terminated for cause. Cause shall include, but not be limited to, any violation of the general rules and regulations of conduct governing the employees. I submit to you that the employer under these circumstances determined that cause existed as a result of the workplace violence and there is no dispute that there was violence in the workplace. Mr. Cockfield stood up whether he walked or not. Now we disagree as to the facts. The testimony is from Mr. Eckery and Mr. English and Mr. Steffens that Mr. Cockfield walked over to where Sean Eckery was and shoved him five to six feet into the doorway. If you take Mr. Cockfield's statement as true, that he stood up and shoved him, he used incredibly more force, excessive force. He then shoved him 10 to 12 feet into the doorway, which is worse. But in any event, he stood up, he shoved him, and he could have caused injury to Mr. Eckery. And there was no indication that there was a physical provocation or that Mr. Eckery intended to physically engage Mr. Cockfield. He inquired as to why he didn't do the work that he was assigned to do. Um, there is no support for Aaron's, uh, Mr. Cockfield's claim of self-defense. In fact, the witnesses' statements and the location of the uh, violence bear out the facts that, in fact, Mr. Cockfield was the aggressor under the circumstances. Um, nor are there any facts to establish that this termination was racially motivated. The employer has repeatedly 
addressed Mr. Cockfield's assertions of racial discrimination and harassment. Mr. Ludlam testified that he has never seen these items that are placed on this table before you now um, and had no opportunity to address what was placed in his car. In fact, Mr. Cockfield did raise somebody was tampering with his car at some point. He did not bring these items in at that time. And those, those allegations were addressed. You'll see two lengthy letters in your uh, materials that uh, HR worked repeatedly with Mr. Cockfield to address some of his concerns that he has raised over the many years of his employment. And in fact, there was discipline and uh, meted out to some employees as a result of their conduct. This incident was not racially motivated and there is no indication that it was. A statement that may be viewed as racially derogatory after the violence occurred was not the impetus for the decision of the employer to terminate Mr. Cockfield's employment. Um, further, Mr. Cockfield did bring a previous EEOC complaint that was dismissed for failure um, to, to prove evidence of racial discrimination. Uh, Mr. Cockfield's assertion that uh, his failure to um, abide by the, the employer's failure to abide by the guidelines is misplaced here. The guidelines are simply that. They are guidelines. The department is vested with the discretion, subject to review, that it is necessary to take the totality of the circumstances into consideration. To suggest that the guidelines control is akin to attempting to put a square peg in a round hole. We don't have facts that previously existed under these circumstances. The, the employer is not aware of any previous incidents of violence. We have an incident of violence under the circumstances. We have a shove, which is admittedly a shove with a greater degree of force than was necessary. No force was necessary. It was not uh, in self-defense. After a full and fair investigation completed by the employer, Mr. Cockfield's opportunity to respond in writing and again um, at the civil service hearing and a face-to-face -face meeting with Mr. Ludlam, Mr. Ludlam made the decision to terminate Aaron Cockfield's employment from the city of Fargo. This decision was not motivated by an improper purpose or politically motivated it was for cause, and I would urge you to uphold the civil service finding. Thank you. Thank you. Close the discussion and open for commission discussion. Uh, if we uh, affirm what the civil service commission did, then he would be terminated. If we decide to do something different, then I would need a different motion. Any discussion? Well, I am. Um nature of my first question was the process and the Civil Service Commission and I don't see in my perspective any reason but to not uphold the decision made by civil service and staff. Mr. Pepper? Well, let me ask you the process. So how does this go? So then we'll make a motion one way or the other today and we'll decide it? And that's the end of it. Okay, I'll, I'll move to uphold the determination. Second. Any further discussion? I know this has been hard for the employees in the public works area. I know that uh, solid waste, many of the employees uh, enjoyed you as a worker with them. And I know it was difficult for many people to testify on this particular hearing. But we do not tolerate violence in the workplace. That's something that we all understand. And uh, I come from the healthcare field. We don't tolerate it. We don't tolerate it anywhere. So it's one of those things that uh, it's a difficult lesson to learn in life, but it's one of those things that I think has to be upheld. So we will take a roll call vote, please. Pepcorn? Aye. Grinberg? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>